right. Well, uh, hello and welcome. Um, I'm your host, Rob Lavati. This is episode 16 of Breathing Room. Um, and I have with me today, uh, Frank Turner. Frank, thanks for joining, man. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Frank is uh, quite honestly one of my favorite singer-songwriters. Uh, he's currently on the Never Ending Tour with his band, The Sleeping Souls. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to have you here today and really looking forward to uh, seeing what we could dive into. Well, th thank you for having me. It's, it's nice to be here. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so for anybody uh, joining Breathe the Room for the first time, um, the premise of this podcast has typically been uh, focusing on mental health and creativity and kind of where the two intersect. Um, you know, they they just feed off of each other so much and often creativity is really a remedy for uh, dealing with anything in the mental health arena, you know? So I really think you're the perfect person to have on because you're so open and vocal <laughs> about your experiences with mental health and your work. Sure. Um, yeah, well, I, I do try. <laughs> yeah, well, it definitely comes through. Um, so the first question that I have for you is, you know, uh, you know, for the last uh, 18, 19 months, it's been crazy times for all of us. Um, but I've really been thinking of those uh, of my friends who are gigging musicians, you know, yeah. uh, dealing with the pandemic and not being able to perform in front of crowds. Um, I can't imagine how strenuous that, that must have been. So I'm curious what your experience is like now being back on the road, performing in front of crowds. Uh, how does that feel? What's it like getting back into it? I mean, the headline is it feels amazing. Uh, that's the short answer to your question. I mean, the last 18 months have been rough, for, yeah, for performing musicians. Also, importantly, the crew as well, people who work behind the scenes, it's been rough for them as well. And it's been rough on a financial level. You know, my job got made illegal um, and it was rough on an identity level as well. I've been touring as hard as I can since I was 16 years old. And this last year and a half is the longest amount of time I've spent in one place since I was seven years old. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very different for me. Um, so it's taken a fair amount of adjusting and there were some difficult parts and my mental health hasn't been fantastic in the last year and a half i have to say um getting back to it i mean it's been strange in some ways like at the beginning of all this i think like a lot of people i sort of assumed there'd be a day where they sort of ran the church bells and we'd all run into the street and do a circle yeah. bit and then open mouth kiss or something um and it's <laughs> not it's not that simple and of course there are all these kind of secondary issues coming in to do with sort of, you know, vaccines and vaccine mandates and vaccine passports and testing and masks and all this kind of thing, yeah. which I'm so, so bored of because among many, many other things, it's not really up to me. Do you know what I mean? And like right. um, uh, people get furious about it in my direction. And it's just kind of like, if I was the one coming up with these rules, that would be legitimate, but I'm self evidently not, you know, and currently my choice are, my choices are to tour with these restrictions in and try and do my job, make a living and present my art in the way that I wish to do so or not. Do you know what I mean? There's no third right. option where I do it in the way that user X5937 uh, anonymous from Twitter wants me to do it. Right. And f fuck that guy anyway. But like, you know, <laughs> and, and I use the word guy advisedly. Um, yeah. uh, and, and uh, you know, so that's been quite frustrating. I mean, the other thing, obviously, being in the USA right now is interesting because um, the temperature of that argument is a lot higher than it is in the UK. And for obvious reasons, I, it, the whole thing's a proxy argument for other political issues. And again, there's part of me that wants to be like, I get it, but leave me out of this, please. I'm just trying to put on some shows and in the way that's allowed currently, you know, yeah. and, and obviously, you know, I'm not interested in people getting sick at my shows. I don't want to be part of the problem and blah, 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 blah. But so, yeah, there's been kind of, new and unexpected kind of tensions and issues to deal with having said all of that like the there's a sense of euphoria in the room generally speaking there's a sense of gratitude would be the other word i would use you know i and i think most people at the show are just extremely grateful that some sort of some sort of live performative art is allowed to happen again there's definitely i mean first of all we've missed it and secondly there's definitely been moments in the last 18 months when it got easy to question when or indeed if it was coming back so the simple yeah. act of standing on a stage and leading a crowd in a sing-along whatever is really cathartic and really magic and special and the final thing i'd say is that i've been pleasantly surprised by the level of consideration in the crowd i don't know if this applies across all shows i can only speak to my own but like i had a bit of a concern that there would be a culture clash between 
to use simplistic shorthand like the bros um who don't care <laughs> on the one hand and then people who are more yeah. kind of edgy about being in a crowded indoor space after all this time and everything and i was worried that there was going to be kind of tension between those two approaches to being in a crowd but actually thus far um it feels to me like people are just happy to be there and people are very considerate of each other's kind of differing levels of comfort and i've been i've been pleasantly surprised by that that's really good to hear. Yeah. And as much as I hate the phrase, you know, I think we're kind of in this place of being in the new normal. Um, sure. And the question mark being how long that's going to last. Um, you Absolutely. Know, I've just gotten back to going to shows myself and feel immensely grateful to be able to be back in that environment. But it is a little weird doing it behind a mask and with a reduced number of people. Um, yeah, but if that's totally. what we have to do to be able to enjoy that space, I think people are willing to make those sacrifices. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And like, and I mean, one of the, sorry to go off on a tiny rant for a minute here, but no, one of the things that the, 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 the whole crowd of people are just kind of like, you know, you should refuse to do shows that have vaccine requirements at the door and this kind of thing. And putting aside whatever my own feelings about that might be, like, you know, it, it's like, if I, if I was to take that stand, that means I can't tour right now. And like, it's not a small thing that I've, you know, the last year has been an utter financial disaster for me and my entire family yeah. and my crew and my band and everybody else. And like, you've got to be pretty privileged to be able to just say, well, just don't work until everything's perfect again. It's just kind yeah. of like, you know, like I have bills that have to get paid. I've already sold my house and moved to a smaller one once. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's it's like it's it's um it's not insignificant that angle of it as well. Anyway, end rant. No, yeah. Um were you were you uh did you run into any issues getting your crew in i know there have been some issues with yeah. getting visas into the united states right now yeah and... it's it's really hard and we had to jump through hoops and pay a lot of money to various american government agencies i shouldn't really go into more depth about that but it's um i mean it's obviously all through the proper legal channels and everything but it's essentially if you pay enough money coronavirus doesn't matter and i think that's pretty deeply unethical but again i don't yeah. really have a choice um so i'm glad that we made it here and i mean it's funny in the whole run-up to this particular us run i was expecting the whole thing to get cancelled at any second and indeed every day this is a six-week tour and we're in the last week right now and i was spent every morning waking up just kind of half expecting for my tour manager to come in and go, yeah, the show's off or the tour's off or we're going home or whatever. So again, gratitude comes into it. The fact that we're even that thus far touch wood immediately. Um, like, you know, we haven't, nobody's got sick on the tour. Um, none of the shows have been canceled. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, that's great. And it sounds like your, your crew has a, a pretty strict COVID protocol. Um, yeah. keeping within your circle and, and really keeping yeah, that. Yeah, totally. And we're, and we're working with the venues and the promoters as best we can, um, you know, to adapt to their policies or get them to adapt to us or whatever. And I think this is the thing. The music industry is full of people who solve problems for a living. Do you know what I mean? So it doesn't yeah. surprise me that the music industry has been flexible at adapting to this. Um, uh, you know, and everybody, everyone's working with good faith. You know what I mean? And, and that's, that's nice to see. Yeah, absolutely. So um, something I want to pull on a little bit, you mentioned that you've really been on the road for the majority of your life, uh, touring yeah. in different bands. Um, I'm, I'm curious what, uh, what that lifestyle has really done for you. Um, and, you know, number one, what it was like not being able to have that and how it feels having some semblance of that back. It's really, it sounds like this yeah. kind of nomadic lifestyle where your home is the hotel for the night and you wake up sure. and do it all again. Um, is that something that you still enjoy to this day? <clears throat> yeah, it is. I mean, I, I was fortunate looking back in the sense that five years or so ago, I started addressing various mental health issues I had, which primarily were in the first instance revolved around substance abuse issues, which I had a lot of problems with. You'll be unsurprised to hear that once I kind of dealt with that side of things, it turns out that there were underlying issues and it was almost what? like that was a symptom <laughs> and not a cause. Who knew? Yeah. But anyway, but like, and part of that whole process was, and you know, and I got married and that kind of thing, which is, mm -hmm. you know, a thing when I was young. Thank you. It's a thing I, when I was younger, I was oh, I'm never going to get married. And, and I did. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, because it's about the person in question, it's not a hypothetical. Um, but so, you know, I sort of slightly started working towards the idea of having more of a life away from the road in the last five years anyway. 
Um, and that's partly for my own sanity. I mean, there, there was there was a time when I was in quite a kind of macho way was involved in this arms race with myself to be the hardest story motherfucker in the universe. Mm. And it turns out nobody else was involved in this race. It was just me kind right. of grinding myself into the floor. And like at a certain point, if you only just do one thing relentlessly forever, you become one dimensional. So um, plus also beyond that, I'm getting older. The guys in my band are getting older. People have kids. I, I don't, but like my, pretty much everybody in my van has kids now. Mm -hmm. My crew have kids and stuff like that. That. and and physically you know you ask what what's life on the road done for me it's damaged my body good lord i mean yeah. i've broken so many parts of myself i don't know where to start talking about it but maybe let's start with the fact that i broke my back on stage do you know what i mean it's like oh, I, I, like you know I, I, i'm i'm pretty creaky uh for yeah. a 39 year old and um that you know i want to i want to keep doing this for the rest of my life but that thought it's like it's a marathon and not a sprint do you know what i mean so um we've been trying to find more sustainable ways just in terms of our own kind of lives psychology mental health physical health that kind of thing so we've gone from playing 250 shows a year to playing be playing 150 shows a year or 150 to 200 and making sure that we have like a bunch of time off in between tours and stuff like this i mean to be honest what we've done is go back to, is go to a level that most busy bands tour at and before that we were just right. off the charts being idiots right but like anyway i mentioned all this to say that like i was fortunate if i hadn't begun that process if if, if the pandemic had happened five ten years ago i think it would have been worse for me psychologically um but it was it was very strange to stay in one place it was an identity was a huge part of it like if i'm not the guy who's getting up and playing a show then who precisely am i or what do i contribute to the world it was an issue that i spent a lot of time wrestling with you know and and um my anxiety uh issues were terrible sorry somebody's uh mr matt is just delivering me a coffee hello matthew sorry i didn't mean to you're all good to no worries thank you very much indeed look at that service with a oh, smile man. coffee down. Um, have i got sugar and milk in here uh you want milk yeah i do yeah thanks mate got milk, sorry. <laughs> sorry about it <laughs> we can cut we can edit this bit out yeah thank sure. you matt. um anyway so so um uh you know um I, I was fortunate that we I had a bit of kind of I hit the ground running as it were yeah um, but that was difficult getting back to it like it's funny because um, as I mentioned like it's not an exaggeration to say that there were moments in time when I mean certainly there are loads of times where I was like well I backed the wrong horse in terms yeah. of my life choices and then you start thinking well maybe that's it maybe I'm done now and, and in terms of both my own feelings about it because I did a lot of adjusting in the last year and a half and it's quite wrenching to then adjust back again um and also like is anyone gonna care do you know what I mean like any music career is just is an act of spinning a plate you know what I mean and mm -hmm. some people can take a break and come back and it benefits them but a lot of people you take a break and no one cares anymore and uh so again i've been pleasantly surprised there's people at the shows right now it's awesome like yeah <laughs> people remember who i am but so totally. yeah coming coming back to it's been cool like i had a funny thing the other day we hit the mid tour grind um in any tour there's a bit in the middle where it's just you're not near the beginning and you're not near the end and it's just kind of relentless and it starts mm -hmm. really kind of dragging you down and i've forgotten that that was a thing because i haven't done it for ages and i hit the mid tour grinds and sort of realized what it was and then was almost kind of like happy about that it was like an old friend even though <laughs> what i'm talking about is not feeling great yeah. it was just like oh yeah well i'm kind of sick of this now this is great um i mean not sick of it but you know yeah. just days where you're basically energy levels are in complete hibernation until five minutes before you go on stage or whatever yep. Yep. it's a strange way to exist totally well, i imagine um you know kind of taking that step back to touring a normal amount has enabled you to focus on some other things. Like I know you're you're working on an album and I wanna yeah. pull on that a little bit later on, but something I really wanna dive a little deeper in um, that you mentioned, if you feel comfortable, um, it seems like we're on a pretty similar path, you know, the last five years of really focusing inward, doing a lot of internal work, focusing on some pretty key mental health things that have kind of always yeah. been there. Um, you know, earlier in life, I had a, a nine year stretch where I, d I identified as straight edge um, and then kind of went off the rails myself and had my own substance abuse problems and off the been, rails onto in, the rails. <laughs> oh, yeah. All yeah. over the rails. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and I've been in recovery now for, for about 18 months. So congratulations. Um, thank you, man. So really curious to hear about what um, that was like for you. I mean, I know there was a period where you um you subscribe to the straight edge lifestyle and i'm, I'm curious yeah yeah 
Uh, that was that, that was a long time ago that's when i was like 16 to 20 i mean yeah. in, in fact in my i always feel bad duty bound to mention this i did a shitload of drugs before i was straight edge it wasn't like <laughs> one of those kids who's not allowed to drink and announce as their straight edge um i mean i had my first whiskey when i was 10 you know what i mean and uh -huh. um kind of speed and weed featured quite a lot when i was younger but yeah i was straight edge for a bit um i, I mean i guess the th the central thing for me is that like i'm hungry to get shit done i'm very uh hyperactive impatient kind of person i want to be busy all the time and i started using various substances that give you more time in your day if you know what i mean um uh, and you know and like i lived a very hectic lifestyle i go away and i tour for 11 months a year i come home and get fucked up for for a month and i did that for like 15 years probably no well 10 at least you know what i mean and like um but it's and again a part of its function of aging there's when you're in your 20s you're invincible do you know what i mean you yeah. can do whatever the fuck you want um so you know it, i've had my ups and downs with it but it certainly there was a moment i always um the the hold steady are one of my favorite bands and there's a beautiful lyric that craig wrote where he says it started recreational and it ended kind of medical and mm. i always think that that's just a beautiful uh description of what my thank you so much matthew you're very welcome that's a great description of what my path through substances has been like in the sense that like I find it quite hard to put my finger on when but there was definitely a point when it was partying and there was mm -hmm. definitely a point when it was self-medicating and I'm not quite sure when it went from one to the other um but that was obviously a problem but even recognizing that problem took a while do you know what I mean because I was oh, extremely yeah. adamant and like for a long time I set up my life in such a way that I had no responsibilities in that I wasn't married I didn't have a permanent partner I didn't have any kids Blah, blah 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 i'm my own boss and so on and so forth and therefore i can do whatever i want and i can get fucked up and blah, blah. yeah and um so in the process of kind of uh building kind of more stable relationships with got older you suddenly realize that there's certain types of behavior that aren't going to fly yeah <laughs> uh if you know what i mean um, yeah yeah and so, likewise it's like there's a point where it's it's a lot of fun and then i remember the exact moment that it was not fun anymore um it, it became work just to keep doing what I was doing on a daily basis. Sure. Yeah. And then, and then, I mean, I mentioned the word macho and, uh, earlier, and I think that's quite a big part of it, you know, in the sense that my touring regimen to a large degree, I was trying, as I said, I was trying to win this race that nobody else was taking mm -hmm. part in, but it was also like I could drink more than anybody else and I could snort more than everybody else and I could stay up longer than everybody else. And do you know what I mean? Like there was a certain degree of kind of like, showing off about it on some level i want to say sure. and, and it took me a while to to walk away from that as well and and it's important to say and i'm sure you know what i mean by this that it's all an ongoing process and probably will be forever i mean i had a quite a because my partner my, my my wife is um not somebody who's spent a lot of time around substance abuse and this kind of thing and like I was trying to explain to her the other day and i was like you do understand i think about cocaine like once every hour probably mm. every day all day forever that's always mm -hmm. going to be true um and she was just like really and like i haven't done it for years now and, and she was like really and i was like yeah really that's it's that's what addiction looks like you know is it's like if i see a marble surface i get excited about it if i if somebody hands me a hotel room key for god's sake yeah. i get excited about it do you <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? and or like a mirror on the table <laughs> right you know and and it's just it's kind of all these things kind of they stay with you you know and it's therefore what i mean what i'm trying to say is it's like it's an ongoing thing and i think it always will be and that's just the nature of the beast yeah i i don't know if you intended it this way and i'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it but um in uh april and may of last year um i checked myself into treatment um for substance abuse and um there was a group of guys every day we'd get together and kind of process in a group and every other day or so they'd ask us to bring a song to the table, you know, to share with the group that's related to where we feel like we're at at that time. And I remember one day I, I brought in your song recovery and um, it was just a very powerful moment to be able to relate what really became an anthem for me in my early recovery. Um, okay. Is that what you were looking to uh, capture in that song? Kind, or? kind of, although there's an irony to that song, um, because it was a song that was written at a period of time where I still believed that I could deal with my issues by toughing it out rather than seeking professional help. So yeah. um, there was a, I, I'm very proud of the song. Um, uh, and it's about affairs of the heart as much as it's about substance abuse. But nevertheless, like 
do you know what I mean? I was still at that moment where it's like, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I just need to pull myself together. Yeah. Um, and then, and then you hit that moment where you're like, I need somebody who's done some training to like have, yeah. a, look, have a look under the hood. And I hadn't yeah. quite got to that point at the moment when I wrote that song. So um, I, it fills me with joy that people take positive messages from that song. Um, but almost in a way, like I'm the target audience for it. Do you know what I mean? Or at sure. least me, me back then. Yeah. Should have listened to what was coming out of my, my own mouth a little bit better. It took, took a little time, but, you know, I think that's a nice segue into uh, one of your uh, two newest singles that you dropped, Haven't Been Doing So Well. Mm. Um, and that song for me is a really poignant message on not just the uh, mental health experience that you were having um, during the pandemic, but really how it's all pulled together for you and how you're kind of starting to find a way out of it. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a. I I've been trying quite hard not to write songs that are too pandemic specific because I think that everyone's going to be hopefully in five years time everyone's going to be like don't fucking talk about that anymore. Yeah. Um. Uh. But uh, nevertheless, I mean, it's you know, it's a, the last year and a half has been very tough for me. My anxiety issues have like spiraled hard um, uh, into into unmanageable places at times, um, and. You know, I, I kind of, it was funny, like I, I, it was the last song I wrote for the record. I had the rest of the record was done. And in fact, most of it was recorded already and ready to get mixed. And I just had this feeling that there was one more piece of the puzzle that needed to go in and uh, sat down. And this often works is just sort of just like, what is it that you want to say? And just almost write it as prose before you try mm. and write it as poetry and just sort of, and that expression, the title came along and it was like, yeah, that is kind of what I want to talk about actually. And that whole thing of asking for help, which, you know, if you grow up um, with kind of traditional male gender roles, if you grow up in a kind of um, uh, medium posh English family like I did, if you grow up um, listening to Henry Rollins, mm -hmm. God bless him, but you know what I mean? Like your predisposition to ask for help and to talk about your problems is pretty low, you know yeah. what I mean? So. Um, so it was quite, I mean, the very, I'm mean, going to therapy for the first time was just such a huge thing for me. And I was so on guard and I was so like, this is bullshit, this is bullshit. It's not going to do anything. And, um, I'm pleased to say I got disavowed of that notion, but, uh, yeah. It, it, so it's a song about asking for help as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. Starting out therapy is such a trip. I feel like I spent the first two years myself lying to this person who I was paying to help me. Because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want them to know everything that was going on under the hood or judge me for who I really was at my core. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I know exactly what you mean. I was fortunate enough that my wife is a, is actually doing her doctorate in psychotherapy right now and had explained to me the whole thing of like, there, the whole point is no judgment and the whole point yep. is it doesn't go any further and all this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I was lucky enough to kind of mostly start honest, although there were some bits that it took me a minute to kind of say out loud. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Well, kind of pulling on the thread of, of the new single a little bit, um, I'd be curious to hear you plug what's coming up in the new mm -hmm. album. I think February is when it's uh, supposed yeah. to come out. February um, next year. I love the name. Uh, it feels Thank like you. an homage to a previous life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's kind of, it's musically, it's kind of a reset. And like, I was sort of planning on doing something like that anyway. But then obviously everything's been reset pretty hard this last um year and a half in obvious ways so and it's funny like i wanted to go in a slightly more tonically aggressive route but having 18 months to kind of sit around at home and then we made the, al the album remotely my producer was in vermont and i was in oxford in the uk and it was mm -hmm. all, and it was a very strange experience but um that whole methodology kind of percolated things a little bit do you know what i mean and sort of concentrated then yeah and it went from being an album that was going to be a little bit more aggressive to being like jesus christ um like i i think possibly possibly even tomorrow we're dropping the first track from the record as like a leak track or whatever and oh uh, cool it's it's definitely the heaviest thing i've ever recorded including all the old hardcore bands i used to be in and all the side projects i was in and i think it's gonna there's no acoustic guitars let's put it that way um <laughs> i think i think it's gonna um surprise some people hopefully pleasantly but i don't really give a shit i mean the song is about artistic integrity anyway so <laughs> whatever um but yeah it's been it's been fun and i'm really excited for it to 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 come out and, it, and among other things it's kind of a record that's designed to be played I, it's a record that wants to be played live i mean i'm very happy with the recorded version of it don't get me wrong but it's like you'll see what i mean the vibe is that this needs to be in a room with bodies flying yeah, totally. I mean, I've kind of always had that uh, that impression of a lot of the music that you put together. 
is that a lot of it is really meant to translate to to that live performance environment. Yeah, I think that the difference this time is that the it, it was kind of like hypothetical and aspirational because I wasn't right. allowed to do any shows while it was happening. So almost yeah. in a way, the 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 gig that these songs are supposed to be played at is the sort of platonic ideal of a punk rock show. You know what I mean? Yeah, so totally. it's in there somewhere. Did you have any um, external collaborators on this album? You know, and listening to Haven't Been Doing So Well, there seems to be this <laughs> Like electronic element that I really haven't heard out of out of you or the band before. Yeah, there's there's I mean there's a lot of kind of well it's interesting you say that actually. Be more kind was a record where I played with kind of loops and sequences quite a lot. Mm -hmm. This is very much kind of like a a band record. That that song in particular has got a big pile of analog synths on it, but like played. Do you know what I mean? Rather than yeah. program. Um, the, but we collaborators. I mean, yeah, the main thing. Um, I parted ways with my long term drummer last summer. Um, mm -hmm. before we started making the record. Long story, personal. I wish him well. Um, but uh, for the out, I had now have a new drummer in my band. He's absolutely sensational. But for the recording, we got um, Elam Rubin from Nine Inch Nails played drums on it. And like, I did up demos with kind of programmed drums on and sent them to him. And he came back with the drums that are on the record, and they're fucking brutal. Like, um, I want to call social services on behalf of the snare drum. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, holy shit. Um, but yeah, so that really, and, and, you know, for any kind of rock music or punk or whatever you want to call it, you rock as hard as your drummer. And I wanted, uh, you know, I, I knew that more than any record that I've done before, this record needed an absolute fucking brutality behind the drum kit. You know what I mean? Totally. Um, and, uh, and we got that out of it. So, uh, yeah, so Elan's all, all over the record. Uh, there's a few songs which he didn't play on. We had Dom from Muse play drums on The Gathering. Um, and then there's a song that I wrote about my friend Scott Hutchison from Frightened Rabbit and Jason from Death Cab played drums on that one because he was a friend of Scott's and, and very much wanted to do that. And then beyond that, um, with Jason Isbell played some guitar on The Gathering, which was awesome because he's a shredder. Uh, yeah. and then, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the band Biffy Clyro. No, I don't believe I am. Uh, it's really interesting. Biffy Clyro are the biggest rock band in the world in everywhere apart from America. Uh, they do okay in America, but like they headline the biggest festivals all over UK, Europe, mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing. They're huge, and and they're old friends of mine, and I love them to pieces. And Simon, uh, who's the singer in that band, did, does a guest vocal for one tune as well. Cool, that's got to come together to make a really uh, unique sound. I'm looking forward to hearing that. And you said the uh, the next single drops tomorrow. Well, I, I'm I'm not gonna uh, promise that I'm right about that, yeah. but it's any it's any day now, Soon. and I think it was supposed to be on a Monday. So uh, <laughs> cool, <laughs> who knows? Tomorrow. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, another announcement that just came out not too long ago is for the uh, the Lost Evenings Festival yeah. that you're doing in 2022 in Berlin. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your process in putting that festival together. What it's looked like in years past, and what you expect uh, next year will look like. Um, well, so we started Lost Evenings in uh, 2017, and the idea of it was that it's four nights, which I headline all four nights, but we have two stages, and we have discussion groups and activism stuff, and we have kind of other venues, and, and we did it in the Roundhouse, which is kind of this legendary 3000 cap room in London, mm -hmm. did the first couple of years there, and sort of took over Camden High Street and had a blast with it, but the idea was always to internationalize it, so in 2019, we took it to Boston, to the House of Blues there, and that was awesome. Um, and then in 2020, it was supposed to be in Berlin. Obviously, that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, so this year, to everybody's surprise, we were able to make it happen again back in Camden where it started out again. But next year, now that's done, next year we're going to try for Berlin again because that's where I wanted number four to be. So, you know, it's been the, the whole process has been upset a little bit, but uh, like everything else. So uh, right. we're working on kind of getting that one back on track again but it's building as an idea as a festival what's cool about it is that every year i think more people kind of understand what it's supposed to be like you know what i mean the first year it was quite difficult like to book bands and sell tickets because everyone's like what what is this we right. don't know what it is whereas now it's like oh i get it okay i understand now and uh and you know hopefully we'll take it around the world and keep building it as time goes by um you know who knows what restrictions or not restrictions will be like next september i mean if they're still bad i'm gonna be have other problems to deal with anyway yeah. um but uh i'm excited to i mean berlin's a good place for me to play germany's awesome for me and um yeah i'm really looking forward to it so each night that you headline you you kind of play a different part of your discography is that right uh yeah there's the kind of theme sets so yeah for example next year we're gonna do 
there's a, a kind of acoustic night or a solo night or whatever or duo me and matt whatever you want to call it um that's the first night that's always the first night and then we have a uh, um, the next year we're doing we're doing one night we're calling it Love Iron Bones because we've right. done 10 year anniversary shows for Love Iron Song and Didn't Keep My Bones and neither of them were in Europe and I know that people then missed out on that so we're like fuck it let's bring those two together that's a lot of people's two favourite records no problem then there'll be a night for the new record that's going to be kind of a hardcore punk evening as it were and then there'll be a quote unquote greatest hits night at the end as well very cool um Diving back to some of the earlier records, I'm curious what the experience was like for you making this uh, very intentional decision about playing and recording solo to, I think it was back on Poetry of the Deed where you went back to yeah. recording and playing with a band. What what was that transition like? And obviously it's something uh, that you, you've stuck with in recording and playing yeah, with yeah, a band. Yeah, 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 sure. I mean, I think one of the things I would say is that for me, I always wanted to have like a band like Springsteen has E Street or Neil Young mm -hmm. has Crazy Horse or Tom Petty has the Heartbreakers or whatever. You know, I wanted to have an established unit just because my years in playing hardcore bands taught me that you can't fake longevity in terms of the tightness of a band. Do you know what I mean? Like there's a yep. kind of, there's a, there's a, there's a glue that comes from playing together for a long time. And plus, you know, we spend a lot of time together and I love the guys in my band and we're basically family. You know, um, so I wanted them to kind of be recognized. And I mean, um, some people played on the first two records as well, but album three was the first time we had like a stable touring lineup. Um, and it was just like, well, rather than, and also we had slightly more money to make up. I mean, we made albums one or two for basically nothing. You know, it was complete right. shoestring. And uh, for album three, there was, we got a producer. We got Alex Newport in, who was amazing. Um, and do you know what I mean? So there was, there, so it was always a thing I intended to do. I mean, there's a bit of a kind of a weird false memory about my solo career that slightly goes around. That's like, oh man, it used to be just him and his guitar. And it's like, I mean, it, no, it didn't, not on record. Mm -hmm. At any rate, there's always been drums. There's always been keys. There's always been electric guitar. Um, you know, but it just took me a while to actually put a physical band together like that rather than just cheating in the studio and playing everything myself or whatever. Sure. Um, but, you know, and it's interesting because Poetry of the D is a record that, like, I like Poetry of the D, but it feels, <coughs> it still feels to me a little bit like we're finding our feet as a group. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I think Even Keep My Bones was such a successful record is because that we sort of, like, ironed out the creases with the preceding record and then we went into the studio knowing exactly who we were and exactly what we were going to do. Um, and it came together really well. Absolutely. And, and outside of your drummer that you mentioned you've parted ways with recently, are you uh, touring with a lot of the same guys that were around on that yeah. album? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, in terms of, I mean, the band is otherwise completely the same. Yeah. Um, and then my crew, I mean, my tour manager, Tree's been my tour manager for for uh, 13 years now. Um, wow. and, and we were friends before then as well. And I mean, most of my crew have been with me for over a decade now. Um, and you know, it's, it is family. Do you know what I mean? And, yeah. um, I do my best to, to look after my crew and they do their best to look after me when I'm being a nightmare. <laughs> well, I want to be mindful of our time. We're coming up, uh, coming up on the hour here, but, um, something that I really was curious about. One of my favorite songs that you put together is the opening track on, uh, England, keep my bones eulogy. Mm. Um, and I'm really curious about the uh, the inspiration and if there's any hidden meaning there that maybe goes over my my head. But, yeah. um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say there's hidden meaning, but there's a good story, um, which was that uh, I was on tour in the states uh, on my own, which I used to do a lot just because I couldn't afford to bring the band over here. But I was on tour in the states, and um, there was there's a magazine in the UK called Kerrang Magazine. They have an award ceremony every year that's mm -hmm. sort of me medium prestigious and they called up my manager and said yeah like do you want to come to the crying awards and we were like well no he's going to be in the states it's not going to work and they were like you should come to those awards wink wink you should definitely come and i was like okay and then it ended up being this absolute nightmare i played a show i think it was like lansing michigan or something and then i flew back to england overnight arrived went to this award ceremony got given a, an award for like spirit of independence or something mm -hmm. um and then then like got super drunk and then the following day got on a plane and flew back to minneapolis oh, um man. yeah i mean it's not good in many different ways <laughs> yeah. um and uh i landed in minneapolis and then kind of was feeling completely alien and then just like went to the hotel the airport hotel bar and got drunk on my own and then went to sleep 
And then when I woke up the following morning, just feeling like I'd been beaten up, essentially. Um, and I had a show that day, which was a festival in, in uh, St. Paul called the Lower Town Music Festival. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was having a shower that morning and just feeling like my life is insane and this is super hardcore. And I was still in my 20s at that point. So as I was saying, I was invincible. But nevertheless, I, I felt pretty battered by all of this. And, uh, and I just started humming to myself in the shower about like, you know, at least I fucking tried. Mm. Whatever, you know, if this kills, if this, this little event ends up killing me, at least I can say that I was trying when I went. And, uh, and it was one of those things where like initially it was going to be the first verse or something or something. And then it was just like, this has kind of feels self-contained, you know, I'm not sure that it needs to be added to, um, and, and I had, and it, this happens rarely for me. I had the music and the lyrics at the same time. Usually I write one or write the other and then combine. And, mm. and this was a case of it arriving fully formed. And that's always a good sign for me. So I came out of the shower and picked up my guitar and chunked out some chords and knocked out a demo. And it basically didn't change from there. It was like, no, that's the song. The only thing that I got added was the horn intro, which was, um, it's a kind of mournful kind of it's a very english sound it's a salvation yeah. army sound and I, and I wanted to add that to the start of the song and it, and it came together very cool well thanks for sharing that with me My one pleasure. thing i want to pull on and then give you a chance to plug anything else that uh that maybe we haven't touched on um you know in talking about the lost evenings festival you mentioned that there's this activism component um yeah. and i know you have some experience with the organization dignity and dying Yes. Um, is that something that you're still involved with? And could you speak a little uh, bit about your involvement there? I, I am. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm the, the leading kind of advocate or activist or anything like that. But um, uh, they asked me a few years back if I'd be interested. And it happens to be a cause that's pretty close to my heart because I have had uh, adjacent experience, should we say, mm -hmm. you know, um, of, of that issue. I mean, you know, you can get political or at least philosophical about it i think the ultimate sovereignty is your sovereignty over whether or not you choose to live or die yeah. and i think the idea of telling somebody that they're not allowed to make that choice and given that everybody anyone who ever has to make that choice makes it in pretty terrible circumstances mm -hmm. for obvious reasons like if to come to somebody in that position and say no you're not allowed to do this i think is horseshit um, yeah. and uh, it seems like a basic issue for me there's a there's a bill going through the House of Parliament in the UK right now that's dealing with this which um, seems to be making headway which is great news and what would that be accomplishing would that be uh, decriminalizing or legalizing De uh, yeah le legalizing the issue I think it would be bringing British law into line with uh, Dutch law I think I'm right in saying okay um, yeah you know I mean uh, it's, it's funny, like people, I sort of shy away from using the word euthanasia because it has obvious negative historical right. connotations and it's not about doing it to somebody else. Do you know what I mean? That's the whole fucking point of what we're discussing right. here. It's yeah. about autonomy, you know, and about, um, yeah, personal, um, it's about your rights as an individual, you know what I mean? Um, but uh, but as, far, as I understand it, the, the bill is, is making good headway. Very cool. Well, yeah, that's something that we're lagging pretty far behind when it comes to uh, American yeah. law. Um, but definitely curious to see how that plays out. Yeah. Well, Frank, I really appreciate you coming on today. Um, anyone in the Asheville area, make sure to check Frank out uh, this Tuesday evening at the Gray Eagle. Uh, really looking forward to that show and seeing you there. And then for anybody listening, uh, stay tuned um, for the upcoming album, FTHC, coming sometime around February 2022. Awesome. Thank you for having me, man. I'm looking forward to Asheville. It's always a blast. Yeah, looking forward to seeing you there, Frank.